Then you've got the the lone wolf. Now the lone wolf is sort of the prima donna of the sales organization. They, I like to say that, and it is true. It's you know sometimes. So those people in other parts of the company say all salespeople are prima donnas. That is not true. But these people are statistically speaking the prima donnas. And what that means is they don't use the, the marketing materials their company created. They uh, don't put their notes in the CRM system. They, uh, they sell stuff that their company doesn't even make. It's time! Work! Play! Evolve! I want to connect the listeners to the best of the best. Welcome to the Evolve Broker Podcast. I'm your host, Pat Costello, the co-founder and principal at Evolve MGA. Our mission for the podcast is to bring the insurance industry the best of the best. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with one of the world's leading experts on sales, service, and customer experience. He's the author of three Amazon and Wall Street Journal best-selling books, The Challenger Sale, The Effortless Experience, and The Challenger Customer. He's also a frequent contributor to Harvard Business Review. My guest today is Matt Dixon. I was extremely excited to speak to Matt because his book, The Challenger Sale, is super applicable to the insurance industry. It's widely regarded as one of the best sales books of all time. His insights are super unique, and this conversation is excellent for any person or business looking to improve their sales. In our conversation, we discuss the five personality types, who a challenger is, six steps to a great sales pitch, and sales management optimization. This episode of the podcast is sponsored by Varuna. Varuna is the agency management system of the future built on the number one customer relationship management tool in the world, Salesforce. Varuna allows you to customize your system, workflows, reports, and dashboards in minutes and allows you to gain actionable insights about your business in real time, letting you use this intelligence to grow your business in multiples. Varuna allows you to know your business so that you can grow your business. Please visit varuna.com to learn more. Without further ado, here is Matt. Matt, welcome to the Evolved Broker Podcast. Uh, Great to be with you, Patrick. Thank you for the invitation. I am excited to chat because I am a really big fan of your book, The Challenger Sale, and I think it applies really well to our audience um, who are in sales within the insurance industry. And so I'd I'd love to discuss the five sales personality types, who who a challenger is. Um, I know you break down the six steps to an awesome sales pitch, and then Um, some sales management optimization tactics, if that's okay with you. Sure. That sounds great. Cool. So I know in your book, you mentioned that you analyzed over 6,000 sales professionals to come up with five personality types. Can you walk us through those personality types? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, So just to give you a little bit of background on the, uh, on the research, you know, we we started this research. It's actually it's funny that we're doing having this conversation this month, Patrick, because it's uh, the book just hit uh, its ten year anniversary. Literally oh. uh, this month, ten years old. Wow, which, which seems like it was yesterday. Um, it's been a bit of a whirlwind tour, um, and uh, you know, since then, and we can talk a little bit about this maybe in this discussion. We've we wrote a follow on book called The Challenger Customer, and uh, we have a new book um, uh, called The Jolt Effect, which will be out uh, next fall, uh, which kind of picks up the story uh, yet again. I think what we've found is. Well, we find a lot of answers when we do research. We surface a lot of new questions too. So, um, and you know, the, the reality is, you know, uh, customer buying behavior is changing all the time, and so there's there's always new questions to uh, uh, to get our arms around. But back to your your question about the uh, the five profiles. So this research started um, a little bit more than a decade ago. So we did the research uh, back in like 08, 09. And the big question at the time, I was I was running a global research group serving chief sales officers across industry, including many in uh, the insurance industry uh, who are clients of ours. We worked with about 700 um, chief sales officers, chief revenue officers, et cetera. And you know, back in 08, 09, uh, as you can imagine, the biggest question they had was like, how are we going to survive the downturn? Um, it was a really tough time to be in in sales, and um, people were missing their quotas by a very wide margin. But it was interesting because across our client bases, we went out to survey them and asked them, you know, hey, what could you use our help with? What should we do research on? The question that started coming back was, um, you know, 
it's no surprise that it's kind of a bloodbath out there right now. You know, clients don't want to spend money. Everyone's risk averse. You know, we don't know when this financial crisis is going to be over. But here's the thing is that in every sales organization, we started hearing that there were a handful of sellers who were still hitting their numbers. They were, in fact, bringing in uh, numbers and deals that these companies would have been excited to get in the best of times, but they were doing it in the worst of times. And so the question that these heads heads of sales had for us was, what is it that these folks are doing that's different uh, from what the average performers are doing? And is there some way we can kind of map that or bottle that into a formula that we could kind of export to everybody else? Because that would be a tide that would lift all boats. And so we started the research, um, went out, we did a global study. You mentioned the 6,000 salespeople. That was the original research study. That's what we used to write the book. And I'll tell you about those five profiles. You know, since then, um, our, uh, uh, there was a group we started at, at CEB that actually trained people on, um, on challengers, uh, to be challengers, uh, manager-led coaching, building challenger messaging, all the stuff we're going to talk about in this discussion. Those guys got spun out a few years ago. They continue to study this. And they've seen the numbers change kind of slightly at the margins over time in the 10 years since we wrote the study, but uh, but not very much. And so the story I'm going to tell you um, now is is pretty consistent. It's held true for the past decade. And what's interesting is that they've now collected data on more than a quarter million salespeople around the world. And and again, the story holds uh, holds consistent. So what we found was the first thing we first big thing we found was that all salespeople. Um, when you run a statistical analysis called a, a factor analysis, all, we find that all salespeople fall into one of five statistically defined profiles. And actually, you use the word personality. I'd probably shy away from that a little bit. Okay. Um, yeah, I think it's an important question, though. A lot of people, when they hear the story, I think they go to, "Wow, that sounds like you're born with you're born that way, right? Can I learn to be that that kind of salesperson uh-huh. too?" We actually steered away from personality as as an attribute. And the reason is there's lots of personality based studies of salespeople. It's for leadership. It's a hiring and firing decision because you can't change somebody's personality. So what we tried to focus on were skills, attitudes, behavior, uh, levels of knowledge, things salespeople can get better at. Um, with time, with the right coaching, with the right training, and with the right support from their organization. Um, and so what we found was across all the variables we studied, we found these five profiles. Um, and you know, in that 6,000 seller sample, um, we I could tell you that every single one of them could be statistically placed into one of the five. Now, that doesn't mean they don't have elements of the other four. That just means they spike in one of the five, right? Think of it like a college major. It, we're, we are all complex people, right? And we've all got elements of all five of these profiles. And, and what we found is our best salespeople, they can dial up and dial down those different types as the situation demands and as the as the customer um, requires. But um, we did find that everyone tends to spike in one. Um, and that's held true, again, across a larger sample of a quarter million uh, globally. The, f- uh, the five profiles are, uh, one is the hard worker. So the hard worker is, um, <clears throat> think of this as kind of the salesperson who who approaches sales like a numbers game. It's all about, I want to feed enough opportunities in the top of the funnel and to follow the sales process in lockstep. And as long as I do that, I should hit my number at the end of the quarter or the end of the year. So for them, sales is a numbers game, right? It's a, it's a game of math. Um, as long as I have enough opportunities in and I follow the sales process, I, I should be good. Now, these folks are a pleasure to manage from a, a leadership perspective because they're very self-critical. They're always looking for that, that thing they can do to to up their game a little bit. They're very open to feedback, very uh, Mm -hmm. self-aware. And the other thing uh, I tell you is that for sales managers, they never have to worry about the the hard worker showing up late or not doing enough, you know, visits or enough calls or sending enough emails. Like these guys, like their dashboard is green. It's like lit up like an all green Christmas tree, right? They're putting the work in. Oh, they're putting the work in, right? And we're not, I'd say we're, in this case, uh, we're very descriptive uh, namers. We're not very, <laughs> it's, it's, it's kind of obvious, right? They work hard. Um, so the second one was a challenger. And you know, from the title of the book, the challenger wins. We'll talk about why in a moment. But think of the challenger as uh, sort of the debater on the team. They've they've got a, um, you know, their colleagues might describe them as sharp elbowed, opinionated, know-it-alls, but they've kind of got it. They've got a point of view and they're not afraid to share that point of view, um, not just with their colleagues and their manager and, and their company's leadership. They're not afraid to share that point of view with their customers. And you know what? They really live for those moments where they can tell the customer, hey, you're, you're thinking about this the wrong way. Let me show you a better way forward. Um, and you know, they their, their perspective, that point of view can sometimes be provocative. It can kind of shake the customer a bit outside their comfort zone. So that's a challenger. And, and by the way, as I, I mentioned, they can you know, as, as you can tell, they, they can be a handful to manage. I remember a meeting years ago. We, this this research was pretty new still. It's before the book came out. 
and I was presenting to a room full of CSOs uh, from across the industry. I'm sure there were some from uh, the insurance industry in that room. Uh-huh. And there was a guy sitting right up front. We got to the part where I said, you know, challengers win. And he kind of put his head in his hands and he was, I thought I heard some muffled sobbing. It was a little bit distracting. So I stopped. There's like 30, 30 leaders in the room. And I stopped. I said, you know, his name was Bill. I was like, Bill, what, what's going on? this should be good news. And he said, you don't understand. I, I fired all those guys like five years ago. They're a total pain to manage, <laughs> oh, you know, no. <laughs> right? Cause they can be a tough fit in some companies, as you know, like mm-hmm. sometimes the, the nail that sticks up gets hammered down and, oh, yeah. and uh, some companies, the culture is like that. It's not, not a lot of tolerance for people having a strong point of view. Um, the third profile was the relationship builder. Um, and the relationship builder, I think of them as we, you gotta be careful here. They're not the kind of glad handing sycophant, like, let's go play around at golf. Let's have the three martini lunch. Let's go to the, let's go to the luxury box at the football game. These are the folks who, who really focus on needs diagnosis. And they candidly, they do what salespeople have been taught to do for at least 30 or 40 years now, which is go in and ask your customer what's keeping them up at night, find out what their problem is, diagnose their needs. And then hopefully during that conversation, they'll say something that you can kind of hook your value proposition to, right? It's been the core of solution selling, if you will, for for many decades now. That's your relationship builder. You know, they they relationship builder is also somebody who, you know, they sit on the customer side of the table. You know, sometimes a customer will ask us to to do things, whether that's how we structure a policy or around our pricing or terms and conditions. And they're asking us to flex. And, and that requires special permission or approval, or it might create some headaches for our company. But the relationship builder sees it as their job to go and advocate for the customer, to go pound the table and say, this is what the customer asked for. This is what's right for them. We need to make this happen, even if it you know, drives everyone crazy on their side. Um, so they really do advocate for the customer. They're a champion for the customer inside the four walls of their company. Then you've got the the lone wolf. Now the lone wolf is sort of the prima donna of the sales organization. They, <laughs> I like to say they, and it is true. It's you know sometimes some those people in other parts of the company say all salespeople are prima donnas. That is not true. Uh-huh. But these people are statistically speaking the prima donnas. And what that means is they don't use the the marketing materials their company created. They uh, don't put their notes in the CRM system. They um, they sell stuff that their company doesn't even make, right? So they, they, and, and what happens is in a lot of companies, unfortunately, we let them get away with that. It, you, there are some exceptions. Mm-hmm. In highly regulated businesses, so um, I might include insurance in there, but certainly in, in certain areas of financial services, uh, pharmaceuticals, medical devices, there's not any tolerance for people kind of painting outside the lines just because the the regulatory and compliance requirements in those businesses. And so in those companies, if you don't follow the rules, you're kind of shown, you're asked to get back in line. And if you don't, you're shown the exits. In every yeah. other company in the world, if a, if a lone wolf kills their number, they're allowed to get away. They get a pass, right? Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. You know, it's so um, funny on that point, Matt. I, I was at dinner with some buddies the other night and I have a friend who is a self-described lone wolf. <laughs> and, I, and the guy is, the thing is, his numbers are astronomical. So yeah, I'm sure they are. <laughs> it's, it's, it's hard to argue with, but he's like, yeah, yeah I, I don't do anything that I absolutely need to do to make the sale happen. <laughs> it's funny. And you know, it, what you see when you, you remember this, Patrick, when you look at the book, you actually find that um, when you look at performance, I always like to say a little bit uh, tongue in cheek, but beware the siren song of the lone wolf, because they actually do pretty well. When you look at high performers, they're, they're like second to the challenger. Um, and I think it's always dangerous to kind of get duped by that approach. And it's not to cast aspersions on, on lone wolves who, who are very talented salespeople in many cases, but for a sales leader or a manager, you know, the, the problem with the lone wolf is they, like you, your friend said, they don't do anything they're not required to. Um, and even those things they are required to, a lot of times they don't do them either. Um, but when you think about how do I scale that approach, is there anything replicable there? When this person just beats to the, you know, marches the beat of their own drummer, and, and there's nothing to teach other people, so it can become a little bit um, dangerous to try to replicate that that profile or that approach inside a large sales organization. So the the last one was the problem solver. Uh, the problem solver is kind of the uh, customer service rep in salesperson's clothing. They're more interested in post deal execution than getting the next deal through the pipeline. Um, now customers love that. They love that the person who sold them the policy, who sold them the solution is on speed dial, right? As soon as they have questions, as soon as they, as soon as they have concerns or issues crop up, um, the sales manager is not so much. They'd rather that that person handed off to the, you know, the, the service department or the implementation folks, mm-hmm. uh, in that the salespeople get on to selling the next deal in their funnel. 
so those were the those were the five profiles. And as I've already alluded to, which I think I suspect will go next, but I'm gonna I'll take a breath and drink water. You, see, <laughs> you have a different. Well, we can go a different direction if you want. But uh, but when we compared this to performance, some interesting patterns emerged. I think that's a great place to start. One of my biggest takeaways was the dichotomy between the relationship builder and the challenger, and how the exactly. relationship builder is trying to make sure the client is always in their comfort zone where yep. the challenger is uh, essentially uh, managing uh, attention in a better way or, right. or not necessarily keeping the customer always in their comfort zone, pushing yep. them out of it a little bit at times. Yep. And I, I know, I think a good place to transition would be a, the primary things it sounds like a challenger is doing that most are not that can be replicable is teaching, tailoring, yep. and controlling. And I'd, yep. I'd like to go through each of those steps briefly. Sure. Yeah. Um, when you say teach, what should a salesperson be teaching a potential customer? Yeah, uh, great question. And you, you know, you described it really well. That is, that, uh, that split, I, I think what's interesting is when you look at those five profiles, before people see the results, uh, you know, if you think back when the, now the story's out there and people kind of know the, know the punchline, right? Um, but uh, back then when we rolled out the research, and if you'd asked a room full of chief sales officers from big companies, small companies, medium-sized companies around the world, which one of these five profiles do you think would be the winning profile? Which one do you want to hire with your next open position? Every single person would have said the relationship builder, literally mm -hmm. every single person. And it is because that person typifies what we always assumed great salespeople do. Now, that um, what, what I would say is that may have been true uh, over the past 30, 40 years. I'd argue it probably was true, certainly during the heyday or the golden age of solution selling. But something interesting happened um, over the past, I'd say the past 10 to 20 years, which is customers got way more sophisticated in terms of how they buy. And the biggest change has been that customers are now boxing salespeople out. So customers out there are learning on their own. You know, we in in um, some research we did after the book came out, which by the way, this is the slide I lead every single keynote with because it's the occasion for challengers. Why challengers win? We found that the average customer is 57 percent of the way through the purchase journey before they ever call a salesperson. Wow. Now you think about that for a moment, right? That's that's kind of like how you and I would buy a car or a mobile phone plan, right? That makes um, sense. You know, you do all your research on your own. You check, you check the reviews. You, you know, you go, you read some blogs and you know, some extra. You go on YouTube. You check the expert reviews, and then you decide what you want, and then you kind of figure out who's cheapest. And what you've decided is, okay, I've created my short list. Now it's down to price. And what this told us is that even in business to business, this is happening, and it's happening in a dramatic way. And so it's pushing salespeople into this price-driven sale. That we think is why this challenger approach has become the new winning profile. Uh, largely because it's not that it was always the winning profile. It's probably true that the relationship builder did better back in the 70s and 80s and 90s. But then when customers started learning on their own, as procurement became more sophisticated, and customers got a lot sharper in terms of what they're buying. They had all this information at their fingertips. And they could box suppliers out, force them to compete on price. It requires a new approach to selling. And that's why we think the challenger wins. Now, um, I'll tell you about the teach, sell, or take control piece, but real quick, just so we don't skip over it, we overlaid these profiles of performance. We found two things. One is, and you you kind of alluded to this, one is that if, when you look at average performers, um, there's kind of an even spread across the five profiles. This one uh, mean-spirited head of sales once said, uh, there's five ways to be average at sales. Um, the uh, But when you look at high performers, you'll get the top 20% of performers in our study. What you find is that um, there's a clear spread in performance that um, the winning profile is actually the challenger. They constitute almost 40%, 39% of all the high performers in our study were challengers. And the ones who finished dead last, as you just pointed out, was the relationship builder. And that was the big surprise to people. It's it's less that the challenger wins because there's there's stuff that even you know heads of sales who taught their people to be relationship builders that they admire about that challenger. But the thing is, it's a real gut punch to be to see that the the profile they're trying to gear everyone toward, you know, the person they're trying to hire, the the culture they're trying to build, the climate they're trying to create in their sales organization, that that profile has the lowest chance of success when it comes to high performance. And so then it, it draws this, you draw this contrast, like what is it about the challenger that's so different from the relationship builder? And you said it really well. Um, at the end of the day, the challenger does three things that that um, they're unique. They teach, they tell, and they take control. Um, let me go through, maybe we'll go through each one of those. We'll talk about this idea of creating tension because it's really important and how it differs from the relationship builder. But when you ask a question, you know, we think about what does the challenger teach um, 
the customer. You know, there was a separate study we did. I mentioned this before, customers engaging salespeople really late, doing a lot of research on their own, saying, okay, I'm going to create a short list. Now I've gone from who's best to all now I care about is who's cheapest. And I'm just going to force these folks to compete on price. And, you know, in that world, there's still this question of like, what, what value does a salesperson bring? So we did um, a follow-on study with the global panel of customers. And one of the things we found was that 53% of customer loyalty, the thing that separates a first place finisher from a second place finisher, the, the vendor that wins the deal from the vendor that comes in second place, which is where nobody wants to finish in sales. Um, the thing that separates them, it's not product quality, it's not pricing, it's not post-sales service, it's not brand and reputation of their company, it's the sales experience. And it's a specific kind of sales experience. It's one not in which the customer, where the salesperson shows up and asks the customer, what's keeping you up at night? In fact, that we found destroys value for customers because it, you know, it puts the job of selling on the customer's plate. Um, what the kind of sales experience that delivers that kind of lift in customer loyalty that separates winners from losers is the kind of sales experience, back to your teaching question, where the salesperson shows up with a unique perspective on how to make money, how to save money, in your case, for your for your listeners, how to mitigate risk, right? That's a big one. Mm -hmm. And these are ideas that the customer themselves, no matter how long they've been in their business, no, how long, no matter how much research they've done, they overlooked. It's an insight that only that salesperson has, only their company has, and it grabs the customer by the lapels and it shakes them out of their comfort zone. It can the, be surprising, right? They're new, exciting Exactly. Surprising insights. That's right. That's right. Okay. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. And so when you, we talk about teaching, that's what the challenger is doing. Now, this is not free consulting. So um, there is a specific, and we'll talk about this in a minute, there's a specific purpose or intent to that teaching. Um, here's, here's the thing that I, I do want to point out. You know, a lot of people, when they hear this idea of bringing insights, bringing ideas, bring, you know, teaching customers, I think sometimes they go to this sort of generic notion of thought leadership. I got to be seen as a thought leader by my customer. And there's nothing wrong with your, if you think about the goal of thought leadership is really to make your customer feel like you're smart. You know, Patrick's done his research. He knows he's, he knows the latest trends. He's, he's with it on the latest issues that customers are grappling with right now. He's got a smart perspective and there's nothing wrong with that. You don't want your customer to think you're not smart, but the difference between thought leadership and teaching and insight in a challenger way is that, you know, thought leadership is designed to show the customer that you're smart. Uh, insight, when delivered in a challenger way, is designed to show the customer that they're wrong, that they miss something. And that's the provocative uh, side of it. It's the thing that, you know, if you think about when you deliver one of these insights, the reaction you get from your customer, if the customer is nodding their head and agreeing with everything you say, you're either, either selling to the wrong person or you haven't said anything really insightful or provocative. When you deliver an insight in a challenger way that really, as you said, is surprising, it is truly insightful. It's not thought leadership. It's true frame-breaking insight. When you do that, the customer's reaction is often negative. It's, mm. whoa, hold on a second. I've never, I meet with insurance brokers all the time. No way. I don't buy it. There's no way I could be exposed to that risk. There's no way that's an opportunity for my organization, et cetera. They, or they squint or they do a double take. But you know, now you've got them. Now they're leaning in. Now they're listening, right? Thought leadership is kind of in one ear, out the other. Um, teaching in a challenger way grabs the customer and shakes them out of their mental model. So that that's the first one. Okay. And of course, um, uh, the other two, tailoring and taking control. So tailoring really is about, you know, if we're it, when we're selling in consumer, uh, tailoring can be about um, tailoring your pitch to a specific individual or their specific uh, context or circumstances, right? So mm -hmm. if we're telling selling insurance on an individual basis or to consumers, we might think about life events. We might think about that. Um, that person and and their specific needs and tailoring and even their personality, right? And tailoring our delivery to that person. If we're selling in a business context, uh, tailoring is really more about, you know, look before a business buys an insurance policy, um, they're gonna we're gonna have to get all the members of the buying committee on board, right? Procurement, legal, finance, boom, boom, boom. And I need to be able to speak the language of all of those key stakeholders, um, and I need to tailor my message to each of them so they each see themselves in the in the solution I'm, I'm proposing. And then the last one, taking control. This is the one we get the most confusion about, I think, because it it sounds a little bit obnoxious. Sounds aggressive. To be honest, it sounds yeah. aggressive. Yeah. You know, I always say when I present this, I always say, look, it's I'm not talking about used car sales for tactics. I'm not talking <laughs> about you know Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, or Boiler Room, or Wolf of Wall Street. We're not uh -huh. talking about that. Uh -huh. I'm not talking about being rude, aggressive, or obnoxious. That's a sixth profile called the jerk. I'm talking about okay. I'm talking about being respectful, empathetic, 
Um, but I am also talking about holding your ground and I'm ho and specifically holding your ground when the customer pushes back. And we know that the customer is going to push back. They're going to push back on our, our insight and whether it applies to them. They're going to think they're, they're totally different, right? They're going to push back on um, the pricing. They're going to push back on our benefits versus our competitors' benefits, you know, and um, and we've got to be able to hold our ground, right? Um, the the key here, and I think you you said it well. If you sum up these these different criteria and you compare it to the relationship builder, you know, relationship builder is likable, they're generous with their time, they sit on the customer side of the table, they they walk a mile in the customer's shoes, but the relationship builder at the end of the day is all about finding out the thing that's creating tension and making it go away. What's the thing that's keeping that customer up at night, and how can I solve their address their needs? Uh, or are they worried about our pricing? Are they worried about our configuration? Well, you know what? Let's see if we can change it for them. Let me go talk to finance and the product guys and get some special exception for this customer because it's right for them. You know, they lobby for the customer. Now, the challenger, um, as you uh, as you said before, they're less concerned about being accepted into the customer's you know comfort zone. They're more concerned about pushing the customer outside of their out. comfort zone. Yeah, push them out, right? And so that what they do is they try to create a level of tension in the conversation tension with new ideas, tension in the way that they tailor that message to a given stakeholder, tension by holding their ground when the, when the customer expects them to cave, right? Um, it, all along the way, around their insights, around their pricing, around their terms and conditions, you know, all these steps. This is a this is a person with a strong will. There's a person who holds their ground. They're not a jerk. They're not rude. They're not obnoxious, but they do hold their ground. And so mm -hmm. those are the three skills of the challenger. Um, and, and of course, you know, when we talk about teaching, the, the big part of that, and we'll, we'll talk about this in a moment, is, is what that conversation sounds like and how's it different from, you know, what we're typically talking to customers about. One specific tactic that stood out to me in the book uh, when you, we talk about making sure you're taking control throughout the whole conversation is the concept of powerful gestures to yeah. take control. Can you yeah. give a couple examples of powerful gestures that people can use within the context of a sales conversation to ensure that they do have control within the conversation? Yeah. Yeah. And it's a great, it's a great question. So this is a, this is a concept that um, came up and then we started testing it uh, with salespeople, but it came up from uh, an old friend of ours, um, a guy named Dan James, who ran sales at DuPont, uh, the large chemical uh, company. And he, um, he talked about this idea of whether it's powerful gestures or powerful questions or powerful requests. And it's this idea about um, asking uh, asking customers to do things or asking them for something in a way that that um, maybe raises the ante a little bit, right? It it calls their bluff. If it, it what it's the its intent is to find a customer verifier. Let me give you a quick metaphor. When I say verifier, what I'm talking about is this you know idea like you know if if I were to count how many people were going to come to my wedding. Um, I'm not going to count the number of invitations I sent out. I'm going to count the number of RSVPs I got back. And so great salespeople are always counting RSVPs. And what I mean by that is they are looking for verification that the customer's moving forward, not that they're stuck, not that they're moving backward. And these powerful requests are a great way to verify that my customer's moving with me. I've raised the ante a bit and they've met, you know, they've called and they're moving forward. Um, or not, right? And then, then as a salesperson, we have to decide: do we do we fish or cut bait, or maybe we go find somebody else in the organization to sell to, or or change our approach a little bit? Um, you know, I'll give you an example. Maybe early on in the um, in the sales process, one of the things we found um, great salespeople do is they are um, maniacal about their time. And so, what I what I mean is. Um, that they don't chase garbage trucks. So they they will disqualify aggressively. They figure out very early on, is this an opportunity worth my time, worth pursuing? The way they will validate that um, is off of external criteria. So for instance, is this customer a good fit based on where we, we've had success in the market before? They're in the right industry. Um, is the company shrinking or expanding? Have they had leadership changes recently? Like there's lots of stuff you can just find publicly that'll give you an indicator of like, this might be a garbage truck or no, this might actually be a good one, but they don't stop there. They'll then look for, they'll look to make powerful requests that validate for them or verify for them that this customer is actually going to be able to move forward and make a decision. So they're looking for signs of decision-making dysfunction. They're looking for, uh, they're, they're making ass of the customer, like at levels of access. Hey, mm -hmm. um, if we're going to, if we're going to do business, I'm going to need some FaceTime with your CFO because any deal of this size, uh, that we've ever, uh, brokered, we've ever sold, um, 
it always goes through the CFO. And so I'm going to need you to make that introduction. That's a powerful request that that um, the customer may or may not come through on. If they don't, pretty good sign to you that maybe you're selling the wrong person or this customer's not serious about buying. They're just kind of, you know, um, uh, they're, they're stringing you, you along. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, if you think about um, other things, so for instance, in, in really big complex deals, um, one thing we might ask for a powerful request is uh, to ask the customer to get all the key stakeholders together, the buying committee, and then give you time uh, to present to that team, right? Uh, or introduce you to the various members of that buying committee. These are things that f- force them to to move, to act, or like, or to you know, out themselves for for not wanting to move forward. And I think it's um, I think it's powerful because what you're really doing in these cases, you're asking them to cash some political capital, right? Are yeah. you are you serious enough about this that you're going to walk me into the CFO and make an introduction? Are you serious enough about this that you're going to get the the five or six key stakeholders together for a meeting and let me present to them? Yeah. And and those things I think are tremendous signifiers. And, and what's interesting is your average performers they won't make those requests. They'll wait for the customer to offer and they'll just kind of they'll kind of bide their time, right? They don't want to be forward. They don't want to be presumptuous. But your best salespeople know that only by ma- asking the customer to do something for me, making these powerful requests, will I get the verification I need that they're either it's a this is a deal worth pursuing or not. Yeah. 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 You understand if it's going to be worth your time. I love the phrase that you used, be maniacal about your time because yeah. if you need to if you need to cut them off, you need to focus on the best chance of success That's with right. the clients that are legitimately going to be considering what you're selling. Exactly. Exactly right. Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. That's that's a great breakdown of the those powerful gestures. The next section I want to cuz I know we have limited time, I would love to go through are the six steps to a great sales pitch, which sure. include the warmer, the reframe, uh-huh. rational drowning, emotional impact, a new way in your solution. Can you walk us through each of those steps briefly? Yeah, sure. Um so the the first up and, and you know, we we had the benefit one of the things I always say about Challenger is that you know, we didn't make this up. We we found what best salespeople had already figured out on their own, and we just gave we gave language to it and told the story. Um, and so, in, in similarly, this whole the six step process that what we call the choreography of an insight based sales conversation, a challenger sales conversation, those six steps you just mentioned, um, that was reverse engineered from companies like Ranger that had already figured this out. And so we can't take credit for it. We didn't invent it. They did. And we just kind of created a framework that everyone could follow. But let me walk you through the six uh, steps. So the first one is the warmer. Now you think about um, how most of us start a sales conversation. It's usually like the first four slides are um, our mission and values as a company. You yeah, know, uh, this is all who the we are. <laughs> this who we yeah, are. Here's totally. all the other companies that trust us with every uh, big logo, our logo brag sheet, right? Yeah. And then there's a page that has like a map with a whole bunch of dots on it to show how many offices you have. Like everybody's got <laughs> the same first four slides. And um, there's two things wrong with that. I think one is that it's um, it's uh, not very differentiated. Of course, it it's not uh, the thing that makes you unique. But also, um, it doesn't go at the beginning of a sales presentation. And the other thing we know is that um, that also at the beginning of a sales presentation or sales conversation, you don't want to start with a question. You want to start with a what's keeping you up at night. I'll, I actually remember a uh, chief information officer I met with years ago. We we're reviewing some of the early research and he was complaining about how all salespeople walk into his office and ask him what's keeping him up at night. And he said, you know, what's keeping me up at night is the thought of the next salesperson who comes in is going to ask me <laughs> in about an hour. He's going to ask me what's keeping me up at night. Yeah. It's and annoying. It, it's annoying. It's very I, annoying. I experience it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's like, it's I, very, I, I don't want to have to explain my business no. to you. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and, uh, what, uh, was interesting is the CIO said, you know, um, when salespeople, cause I said, it's interesting you're complaining about this because most heads of sales think that's a very empathetic way to sell. That's the core of needs diagnosis and solution selling. And he said, it's, it's not the questions I object to. Everyone's got to ask questions when they sell. I'm not going to do business with a vendor who doesn't get to know me and my company and my team and what's important to us. But, um, I hate the way salespeople today use that question where they put the job of selling on my plate. It belongs on theirs. When they come in and ask me what's keeping me up at night, what they fail to appreciate is they're going to meet with more CIOs just like me in a week than I'm going to meet with all year. So don't ask me what's keeping me up at night. Tell me what should be keeping me up at night. Let's start Mm. the conversation there. And so the warmer is specifically designed to create a different feel from the very, very beginning of the sales conversation. Think about a slide in which you as a salesperson are putting on a on a slide, you know, just literally bullet it out. What do you think the answer to the question, what's keeping you up at night, would be 
but don't ask the customer that question. Just take your best stab at it. So, you know, um, we talked about Granger before. They're in, you know, they sell supplies to buildings. You think about, um, you know, if if uh, you or I were a Granger sales rep and we're going to sell the Granger value proposition to a head of purchasing in a hospital, you know, we could hypothesize that they they probably care a lot about COVID. They probably care a lot about worker safety. They probably care a lot about productivity and patient outcomes. They probably care a lot about costs, right? We could do a pretty good job. The goal here is not to be right. Now, you're not going to be right without talking to the customer. The goal is to make the customer feel like, you know, first of all, what they're thinking is, thank God you didn't ask me, it was keeping me up at night. But it also create, just creates a different feel up front. That's going to require that you as a salesperson do a little bit of homework. Now, you might be calling on a company or a customer you've never met with before. And so you're wondering, how would I know what's keeping them up at night? But here's what I tell you is, reflect back on the other companies you've met with, the other customers you've met with who are similar to that customer. What was keeping them up at night? Then I would tell you, um, do a little bit of homework. See what what news you can gather about this company. Are they shrinking? Are they are they growing? Have they been acquired recently? Did they just acquire somebody recently? You know what's going on in their business. And, and again, generate a hypothesis. Um, or even another resource, go ask your colleagues, right? Say, hey, I've, I've never sold to anybody in this space before, but I know you sold that deal last month. Can you tell me a little bit about what they were focused on? Because I think it might be relevant for this customer too. Now, what again, the goal is to create a conversation, not to be 100% right. So the customer's going to look at your warmer, look at your list of hypotheses, and they're going to say, yeah, yeah, this is great. Um, we're totally focused on this. You know, Not so much these other things over here. And by the way, you miss a few things, right? But it creates a productive conversation right away. Then the mm-hmm. second step, if if the warmer is all the things that you know the customer already knows about, the reframe is the thing they didn't see coming. So this is the insight that grabs them by the lapels and shakes them out of their comfort zone. It's the thing that they uh, they overlooked. It's the thing they missed. That's where you deliver your insight. Now, um, if you're going to say as a salesperson, if you're going to say something provocative, frame breaking, truly insightful, you're going to show the customer a new way to make money or save money, avoid risks that they've never come up with on their own before. You better be able to back it up. And so the next step beyond that, we call rational drowning. You got to be able to have data uh, that backs up that what you just said is factually true. Right. Um, the this next is step- the graphs, the charts, the yeah. business case for exactly the the shocking insight that you laid out in the reframe. That's right, and and it's um it's got to be it's got to be verified. And now the thing is, for business customers, they'll they'll often buy an emotion but justify with reason. Um, and so we also need to appeal to the emotional level. We call that uh, the emotional impact. So we need to think about like why does this insight matter to this person? Uh, why does it matter to their team, to their department, to their objectives, to their you know um, their as career aspirations? How do we really make them see themselves in this? And that's going to differ. Uh, you know, whether you're talking to HR or finance or legal or IT or whoever you're meeting with or or people who are senior or people who are junior, you know, they're going to see different angles on this opportunity and you got to tailor your message uh, to them. Now, the fifth step is the new way forward. So the new way forward is where you show the customer um, what they could make, what they could save, what risks they could mitigate by solving for that reframe, by solving for the opportunity you just taught them was out there you just backed up with data and you just made them personally care about. And it's at that point where the customer, this is not yet about your company and your product and your policies and all the stuff you can do for them. This is just, this is a supplier agnostic thing. This is merely you saying, what would it mean to you as a, as a person, as a business owner, as a leader to be able to solve for that opportunity? What would it mean in dollar terms? What would it mean in terms of risk mitigation and exposure you're seeing in your business right now? And then box number six is where you talk about your policies, your solution, your products, your services, your company. And it at that point, if you've done this well, it's merely a happy coincidence that you're the only company out there that can actually solve the problem that you've laid out for the customer. Getting this right, there's two steps to get this right um, for a uh, an organization. By the way, I would point out, for most companies, I would tell you this is not the job of your salespeople to come up with this. This is the job of the company to come up company. with this. Yeah, yeah it's the organization. It, that's right. Because you don't want your salespeople coming up with like a different insight for every single uh, customer. You want insights that map to key segments in in the market that you sell into, key use cases, for instance. But the two key things you have to get right are one is the box six. This is the R solution piece. And um, you know, I, I was sort of saying tongue in cheek that we all have the same first floor slides in the beginning of our pitch deck. And the thing that's really wrong with that is a, it doesn't go to the beginning of the pitch deck, but b, there's nothing unique about that stuff. And so. As suppliers, we and as leadership teams, we've got to actually wrestle with the question, why should the customer buy from us instead of our competitors? 
especially in this industry, think about how commoditized many of our customers will feel like insurance is. Oh, it's, a, it's all the same, right? Um, there might be certain elements of the product or service that are similar or even identical, but what is the reason they should buy for company A versus company B? Because I guarantee you, they've got company A, B, and C on their short list, and you better be able to differentiate why your, your company is the one they should buy from instead of the other two. Now, th- what that does is it actually ties to the second step. So you, the next question you ask yourself, once you ask, answer the question, why should the customer buy from us instead of our competitors, what is it that makes our company truly unique, our, our service, our value proposition, our policies truly distinctive and unique? And that's the thing we're trying to lead to. We're not leading with it, we're leading to it. Um, but the other question you got to ask yourself is, why do customers not pay you for that competitive advantage today? Why is there not a, a line of customers around the block waiting to write checks to you for that unique benefit, that unique differentiator that you provide that nobody else can touch with barge pole? The answer to that question is the reframe. This is the thing that has to be true in the customer's world for them to want to pay you for the thing that makes you unique. Those are the two key po- uh, components, the two key pillars in that six-step process. I wouldn't say the rest of it is kind of window dressing, but the rest of it is, those. if you don't get those two pieces right, figure out why the customer should buy from you instead of your competitors, and then figure mm-hmm. out what would have to be true for this customer to say, yes, I need that capability and, and I'm willing to pay a premium for that capability um, over other other capabilities I could buy in the market. If you can't answer those two questions, this whole thing doesn't work. Mm-hmm. And th- this six-step process seems like a way that you can help your organization build out a team of challengers. And yep. correct me if I'm wrong, Matt, but you actually even have... In the back of your book, interview questions yeah. to help um, scan for cha- challengers in the candidate review process before anyone's even hired. Correct? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, you know, one of the unfortunate realities about challengers is hiring our way to victory is not an answer for any company. You know, there you, there are not enough high performing challengers out there looking for jobs. Certainly not in this environment. Um, out there looking for jobs right now um, that you could actually fire all your existing sales. Now you would do that, but fire all your, your existing salespeople and go hire an army of challengers. Just never going to happen. It's too small of a percentage of the labor market. It raises interesting questions about, is it more important to hire somebody with sales experience or insurance industry experience um, who can challenge customers? Or are we better off hiring challengers who we can teach the insurance business to or who we can teach how to sell? Mm-hmm. But if you think about challenging for a moment, you know, there are lots of of places where you can find challengers. You can find them in law, you can find them in marketing, you can find them in product, you can find them all over the place and um, find them in consulting, right? Uh, challenging is is a professional kind of posture that people take. And there are opportunities, I think, for us to cast a wider net to go find challengers, maybe outside of our industry, uh-huh. um, who haven't had 20 years in insurance, and then and then teach them the ins and outs of our, our business. Now, um, Getting that right, though, requires that we we are thoughtful about how we screen for those capabilities. So we do uh, posit a number of like behavioral interviewing questions that you could use to try to diagnose uh, somebody's challengerness, if you will, in an interview. I will say there there are higher end assessment tools you can use as well. Uh, for any of your listeners interested in that, uh, the company Challenger Inc. I mentioned before uh, provides that service to companies who are you know oh. hiring hundreds or thousands of salespeople on an annual basis doing it in a more scientific way so you can assess at scale um, is a very powerful approach. But for the small boutique shop, those uh-huh. interviewing questions would be um, uh, very appropriate, I think. I realize the the challenger profile is not necessarily a, a personality profile, mm-hmm. but are you familiar with the Enneagram assessment, Matt? Yeah, I, I'm some, I was not an expert, but, but somewhat okay. familiar, yeah. I, I only bring it up because we just went through this with our whole company and yeah. uh, my brother and my dad are going to love this because they're both challengers is literally their personality type. <laughs> uh, so they're eights. The, the eight is yeah. the challenger personality type. And obviously there's, there's differences uh, between this and between the Enneagram, but um, they're going to be fired up to hear that uh, they're challengers. Well, it's, but you know, you, uh, Patrick, you raise an important uh, point here. I think sometimes when people hear the story of Challenger and they think about the challengers they know, uh, so you mentioned your, your brother and your dad, you know, you think about uh, other colleagues in the company, those, those like 
hardcore die in the wool challengers. And we all know them, right? We all know them in our companies. And sometimes I think we can say, well, boy, that seems like something you're just born with. But again, we didn't study personality. We studied stuff that people can learn over time. And, and the evidence we have that you actually can learn this, as I said, one of the first things after this research came, back, it came out is we had a lot of companies asking us, hey, can you come in and teach our salespeople to be challengers? And so we we embarked on a it's for ten years working with companies to try to teach their salespeople to be challengers. Now I'll tell you, um, it is not a hundred percent success rate, but uh, I'd say it's probably more like seventy percent. But wow. the thirty still yeah, great, still really good. But thirty yeah. percent who don't make it, I tell you, it's not because they can't; it's because they choose not to. And and a lot of times these are salespeople who've been really successful selling a different way. And they hear this message from the, the new head of sales or the the leadership of the company about we're going in this challenger direction and want to assess everybody. And, you know, these people get the results and they're like, well, I'm more of a hard worker relationship builder. I guess I don't, I guess I don't fit here anymore. And they kind of opt out of the journey. Um, one of the things I tell people is though, remember the 70% do make it. If they opt into it, if they choose to get better, they can get better. And we've seen that uh, your challenger levels, your performance on those key skills can improve with great coaching, great training, great support from the organization, specifically an organization that builds those uh, those insight-based uh, sales conversations and that content for you. But you know, you, you really do need to think about the, or we as leaders need to think about um, uh, the kind of opt-in, opt-out element of it. You're never gonna get 100%. I don't care what you're doing, rolling out a new mm -hmm. CRM system, a new comp plan, new sales methodology, you're never gonna get 100% of your sellers to adopt it. Um, I think savvy sales leaders kind of, they look at the high performers and the high performers are selling a different way and kind of opt out. Um, you know, I'm not gonna mess with what's bringing success, but I think that the market eventually is going to tap those folks on the shoulder and say, hey, you need to up your game in certain ways. And, and what we know actually about high performers is that they're actually some of the first people to get in line for challenger training, because right? they're looking for that, that they wanna stay at the top. They want that mm -hmm. next advantage. Um, they wanna hone their skills. And so um, we don't see a lot of people opting out, but you do see some. Uh, and it's people who've mm -hmm. been in their careers for a long time and have been successful selling a certain way and they feel like they're getting the wrong message from the organization. So. One of the most important parts of making sure that the challenger system is adopted across an organization is that frontline sales manager. Yeah. Are there any attributes that you think would be great for a frontline sales manager, manager to have to make sure that they're successful in their job? Yeah, uh, great, uh, great question. So we, in the back of the book, there's, I think it's one of the last chapters, we have a chapter on what this means for sales managers. And what I'll tell you is uh, there's, there are two big failure paths for companies that go down a challenge, the challenger path in that it just blows up in their faces and doesn't work. And it has happened. And I can point to the two failure paths. The first one is those companies don't invest in creating those messages, those conversations, those insights. They just send their salespeople out and they say, go forth and challenge, you know, grab the customer by the lapel, shake them, not physically, but, you know, shake them out of their, their mental model. Um, take control, you know, tell the customer they're doing it wrong. But the, if your salespeople are going out and, and challenging customers, but they've got nothing insightful to say, they're actually just annoying. They're not challenging. So you got to arm them with a good insight, right? And that's the job of the company. So that's failure path number one. But the second one is what you just uh, talked about is failing to invest in managers who know how to coach and failing to create a great coaching approach and a great coaching culture in your sales organization is a definite second failure path that we've seen companies, unfortunately, um, struggle with. Now, the reality I think for sales managers is um, as, a, as a group, they tend not to be very good at coaching and they tend to get coaching confused with performance management or, or what I'd call spreadsheet coaching, right? How many visits do you do this week? Where's that deal? Um, did you send enough follow-up emails? Have you, you put your notes in the CRM system? That stuff is performance management. And, and there's, a, there's a job that the manager plays as a performance manager, but coaching is about helping people with the behaviors known to drive success. But they're not about deal inspection. They're not about you know activity inspection. They're not about spreadsheet management. They're about sitting down with your salesperson and working on things like teaching or tailoring or taking control or building tension. You know these are uh, these are things that that people won't they can get exposed to in a classroom or by reading mm -hmm. the book, but they're not going to master in the classroom. They the only way you get good at this over time is through um, kind of work one on one with a great coach with a great um, sales manager. And mm -hmm. the attributes of a great sales manager, when we talk about this in the book, are, are one, uh, the ability to demonstrate themselves what good looks like. So in this case, the, the manager, even if they're not a born challenger, if you will, um, mm -hmm. even if that's not their natural predisposition, 
um, they've got to be able to demonstrate, here's how you teach, here's how you tailor, here's how you take control, here's how you create constructive tension. Because if they can't do it, if they can't demonstrate it and show the sales rep what it looks like and sounds like, it's going to be hard for the salesperson to kind of get their heads around it. And you're asking me to do yeah. something you can't personally do yourself. It's hard um, to respect that. It's hard to respect it, 100% right. Uh, the second thing is they've got to be great coaches. We talked about that uh, a moment ago. Um, they've got to understand the difference between coaching and, and spreadsheet or performance management. And then the last thing we found that great managers um, possess is they're really good at uh, innovating. I would say innovating in the red zone. So they are very good at helping um, helping their salespeople get stuck deals unstuck. You know, let's let's see if we can get creative. Let's see if we can figure out a new angle in. Let's see if we can figure out a new message to get that customer to kind of re-engage with us. Let's see if we can figure out why this customer's gone radio silent on us. Um, you know, they're they're very good at coming up with those ideas. They don't they themselves know they're not the source of all the great ideas out, out there. So great managers also have a really deep network of colleagues inside their company, and they're constantly harvesting from that network a rolodex of best practices and tactics and and uh, techniques that they can then use with their own salespeople who might be struggling, you know, to get a deal over the line. Well, Matt, thank you so much for breaking that down. I think if people want more insight into um, what it takes to be a challenger mm -hmm. or what it takes to build in that challenger system within your organization, they should definitely pick up your book, The Challenger Sale. Um, I know I really enjoyed it. I know there's things that we can apply immediately to our organization. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I know a lot of the insurance agencies that we work with can get value immediately from not only listening to this, but also reading the book. I know that, um, Matt, you are a speaker, you're a public mm -hmm. figure. If anyone wanted to get access you, to you or to follow you somewhere, would it be like your website for the blog or would it be uh, social media or is there anywhere that if someone was listening to this and like, oh, I want Matt to come speak at my event to um, teach my producers, is there somewhere they could access you? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, the easiest place is probably LinkedIn. So, um, you know, what I'd encourage um, your audience to do if anybody's interested in, you know, picking up the conversation, they'd follow questions or, or maybe they do want to have me come and um, uh, present to their team. Um, uh, reach out to me on LinkedIn. Uh, it's Matt Dixon, D-I-X-O-N. And shoot me, a, shoot me a LinkedIn message. Tell me you heard me on on the show and uh, you'd love to pick up the, the conversation. There's another, uh, another website I maintain, uh, DixonSpeaks.com. Um, and you can go check out a number of the other books and articles I've written and uh, check out some videos of, of other presentations and got a, a blog there that I probably don't do a very good job of maintaining, but it is there. So, um, <laughs> but a, another place that uh, but people can uh, check me out. And, um, and, and I'll tell you, as again, I, I mentioned that the sequel to the book, um, the second book was The Challenger Customer, which is, you know, how do, how do high performers um uh, how do they manage the consensus purchase? You know, when you've got a lot of stakeholders on the customer side, how do they pick the right person to hitch their wagon to? And how do they yeah. get those diverse and dysfunctional buying committees to actually agree on something? And then the the forthcoming book called The Jolt Effect is all about how do we deal with this problem, uh, you know, of what happens when the customer says they want to buy from us and then they just go dark.